Hey, little buddies, it's Uncle Rick from the Uncle Rick Audiobook Club. Today's podcast, we are reading from Captain John Smith from a series of books called True Stories of Great Americans. John Smith, you know, was way back in the 1600s. He was involved in the settlement of Jamestown, the first English-speaking colony in the what would be the United States. He got here even before the Pilgrims did in 1620. Had some pretty strange adventures, and today we are reading, starting with chapter 10, which is called Prisoner to the Indians. You can imagine this is going to have some uh, rather uh, nerve-wracking experiences in it. Many of the colonists still had the habits of petulant children. As one favor or entertainment was ended, they were impatient and querulous until another was provided. As soon as the shooting season was over, they began to find fault with Captain Smith, though but for his judgment and energy they might well have all perished. The reader must remember that the company was not such as he would have selected. He would have chosen those only who are seriously bent on establishing themselves in the new world and were not afraid of work. But the company in London had made up the shipment, and in it were included many who were designated as gentlemen. Some of these went because they expected to pick up gold without much digging, while others were simply, as we would express it now, out for a lark. There was no gold to be found, and they were not likely to catch many larks, though the winter skies would soon fall upon them. They now complained that Captain Smith, once on the Chickahominy, should have followed up its course till he ascertained whether that would lead to the South Sea, or Pacific as we call it, For one object of all expeditions sent to America was to find an opening by which ships might sail through into the Pacific and thus have a much shorter voyage to the East Indies. Nobody at that time had any idea of the width of the newly discovered continent. Of course, Smith had sense enough to know that ships built for ocean travel could not pass through by so small a channel as that of the Chickahominy River, even if it were open all the way across. The James was larger, but its falls and rapids show that no navigator could get through by that route. But the captain did not argue long with the thoughtless and discontented, though he told them the immediate need was to lay in supplies for the winter. He was desirous of exploring the surrounding country as far as possible and making friends of more of the Indians. He therefore organized a small expedition to explore the Chickahominy as far toward its headwaters as possible. With a barge and as large a company as it could accommodate, he passed up the river about 50 miles. From that point, the channel was too small and too much obstructed for the barge. He therefore persuaded the Indians to let him have the use of a canoe, and he engaged two of them to paddle it. Taking two of his men with him in the canoe, he left the others with the barge, carefully instructing them not to go ashore during his absence. He then ascended the stream about 20 miles to a point where it was too difficult to proceed further. Here he left the canoe, telling the two Englishmen that remained in it to keep their firearms ready for instant use and to signal him by a shot if there was any danger. He took one of the Indians with him as a guide and set out to examine the region. A few minutes later, Captain Smith heard a terrific war whoop and knew he was about to be attacked. As he had heard no report of firearms from the canoe, he believed that the men he left there had been surprised and murdered, and this proved to be true. They had disobeyed his orders, having gone ashore, built a fire, and lain down to sleep beside it, where, of course, they were murdered. The men in the barge were equally irresponsible. They went ashore and were wandering about carelessly when they were attacked by a large band of Indians. With difficulty, they succeeded in getting back to the barge, all but one whom the savages caught. This poor wretch, hoping to save the life, his life by serving as captors, told them all about Captain Smith's movements. But after getting this information, they put him to a cruel death. As soon as the captain knew that his men in the canoe had been treacherously murdered, he knew also that there must be Indians lurking about to entrap and murder him. Therefore he promptly seized the Indian that was with him, disarmed him, and bound the Indian's arm fast to his own left arm, thus using him as a shield against any arrows that might be shot by the savages. Very soon he saw two Indians bending their bows, evidently intending to harm him. Before they could use them, he discharged the pistol and drove them away. He kept the Indian guide between them and himself, knowing that others would soon appear, and sure enough, presently appeared the great chief Opakakanoa, 
with more than 200 Braves. Captain Smith fired at them with his pistol, killing three and wounding several, one of whom died of his wound. And thus for a time he kept them beyond arrow shot as they were afraid to come near firearms. The Indians tried to induce him to surrender on the promise that they would not take his life but he would not submit unless they would let him get away to his canoe and go down the river. Then, facing the savages all the time and occasionally firing at them, he backed away slowly. Unfortunately, he did not once look behind him to learn where his retreating steps were leading him, and after a time he stepped off solid ground and sank up to his waist in a swamp. It was impossible for him to get out unless he had assistance, and he therefore threw away his pistol and surrendered. The savages drew him out of the swamp and carried him to the chief. Smith's presence of mind never left him, and he was as full of resources as ever. He had a small ivory pocket compass, which he used to keep track of his routes and his explorations, and this he now presented to Opa who was entertained and puzzled by the needle, which he saw through the glass but could not touch. And I have no idea if I'm pronouncing Opa right, but you just going to have to bear with me. It's the best I can do. Smith not only explained to the Indians the real use of the compass, but added imaginary powers. He says that by means of it, he proved the roundness of the earth and skies, the sphere of the sun, moon, and stars, and how the sun did chase the night around the world continually. Then he told them of the greatness of the land and sea, the diversity of nations, variety of complexions, and how we, the English-speaking people, were to them antipodes and many other such like matters. Antipodes? Or is that Antipodes? I'm not sure. If I had my handy Webster's close to me, I'd look it up for you, but I don't. No doubt his lecture was very entertaining, even to the poor savages who could not understand it all. Nonetheless, like many another teacher of new things, he was doomed to persecution. They tied him to a tree and drew their bows to shoot him, when the chief raised his hand, holding the compass as a command to them to desist. Captain Smith was then put under strong guard and was carried in a procession to a near village, his sword and firearms as trophies being carried by the chief himself. The name of the village is given as Oropax, and out of it came all the women and children to meet the procession and see the captive. They never before had seen a white person. Then there was a grand dance. Every Indian carried a war club, a bow, and a quiver full of arrows, and was decorated in the most fantastic manner. Some wore on the head a dried bird with wings outspread, others pieces of copper, or long feathers, or shells, or snake rattles, while all were painted in brilliant red around the head and shoulders. At the village, while he was still carefully guarded, the Indians set before him such an overabundance of good food that he began to suspect they intended to fatten him preparatory to killing and eating him. But no tribe of the North American Indians has ever been known to be cannibals. One Indian, to whom he had formerly given some trinket, was good enough to bring his blanket to him, for the days were growing cold. But another, whose son Smith had wounded seriously, was angry toward Smith. They supposed Smith must be a great medicine man, and asked him to cure the wounded boy. He said he could not do it without some medicine that he could get at Jamestown, and he proposed that he be sent there to get it. This the savages would not consent to. Then he asked that three of them might go with a note from him, and they fell in with his plan at once. They were glad of an opportunity to spy out the condition of affairs at Jamestown, for they intended to attack it. Smith, taking a leaf from a memorandum book, wrote a letter to the colonists in which he told them of his situation, warned them to expect an attack, and advised them to show the messengers the cannons and tell them what wonderful arrangements they had to shoot and blow up any enemy that should attack them. He also asked that certain articles be sent to him, and before the messengers departed, he told them what things would be given them to bring back, if they presented that paper at the fort. They returned in three days, bringing all the articles that he wanted, and all were astonished and bewildered by this proof that he could make a piece of paper speak to his distant friends. Moreover, the messengers gave a terrifying report of the dangers of the fort its great guns and their thundering explosions, its mines, its strong defenses, and the warlike character of the men in the colony. Therefore, the Indians gave up their intention of attacking the colony in force. But this did not end the captain's difficulties and danger. While the messengers were gone, the man he had wounded died, and the man's father became furiously bent on revenge. His attempts to kill Smith were thwarted only by the constant care of the guards, 
and it was determined to remove the prisoner to a distant place. The procession was formed again and resumed its march. It took a roundabout course to exhibit the prisoner to the people in many villages and to other tribes, coming back at last to the place where Opakankano had his capital. I think that's close. Here they went through a strange performance which puzzled even Smith, who had learned so much of the Indian character. Several medicine men, painted in black and red and smeared with oil, dressed themselves in skins of wild animals, kept up a constant noise with rattles made of gourds, and with the wildest shrieks and howls danced around him from morning till night. There was no eating during the day, but at sunset all were fed bountifully, the medicine men, however, taking care to eat by themselves, not with him. Smith's description of this strange performance is so picturesque that it's worth quoting in full. Early in the morning, a great fire was made in a long house, and a mat was spread on one side as on the other. On the one they caused me to sit, and all the guard went out of the house. Presently came skipping in a great grim fellow, all painted all over with coal mingled with oil, and many snakes and weasels' skins stuffed with moss, and all their tails tied together so that they met on the crown of his head like a tassel. And round about the tassel was a coronet of feathers." the skins hanging round about his head, back, and shoulders, and in a manner that covered his face, with a diabolical voice and a rattle in his hand. With most strange gestures and passions, he began his invocation and environed the fire with a circle of meal. Which done, three more such like demons came rushing in with like antic tricks, painted half black, half red. But all their eyes were painted white, and some red strokes like mustachios along their cheeks. Round about me these fiends danced a pretty while, and then in came three more as ugly as the rest, with red eyes and strokes over their black faces. At last they all sat down, right against me, three of them on the one hand of the chief priest, and three on the other. Then all with the rattles began a song, which ended, the chief priest laid down five wheat grains, then straining his arms and hands with such violence that he sweated and his veins swelled, he began a short oration. At the conclusion, they all gave a short groan, and then he laid down three grains more. After that, they began their song again. Then there was another oration, ever laying down so many corns as before, till they had twice encircled the fire. That done, they took a bunch of little sticks prepared for that purpose, continuing still their devotions, and at the end of every song and oration, they laid down a stick betwixt the divisions of the grain. Till night, neither he nor they did either eat or drink. And then they feasted merrily and with the best provisions they could make. Three days they used this ceremony, the meaning whereof, they told me, was to know if, he, if I intended them well or evil. The circle of meals signified their country, the circles of grain the bounds of the sea, and the sticks my country. They imagined the world to be flat and round like a trencher, and they in the midst. Opichapam, the king's brother, invited him me to his house, where, with many platters of bread, fowl, and wild beasts, bade me welcome. But not any of them would eat with me, but put up all the remainder in baskets. At my return to Opakankanos, all the king's women and their children flocked about me, as do by custom to be merry with such fragments. All savages are very superstitious, and it was easy for the medicine men, or priests, as Smith called them, to make the tribe believe that by these ceremonies they could find out what was in the prisoner's mind. Then the chief offered him life, liberty, and everything he could wish for, if he would show them how the fort at Jamestown could be captured. But, of course, such a man was not thus to be tempted into treachery. On the contrary, he told them the white men were so numerous and strong and wise that the Indians never could overcome them and would better be always friendly to them. They brought one of his pistols and asked him to fire it. Knowing that they wished to learn how to use it, he fumbled with it in a way to break the lock and made them think it was an accident. They had obtained somehow a bag of gunpowder. Perhaps they stole it at Jamestown, and they showed it to him and told him they intended to plant it in the spring and raise a crop. He made no objection. After a long delay, finding that he could neither be bribed nor frightened, and that they could do nothing with him, they took him to a place called Werewokomo, no, Werewokomo, where Powhatan, the king of all that country, resided. He was sometimes called the Indian Emperor of Virginia. It is believed that Werewokomo, 
It's a tough one. Where oh wo como co. Okay. Where wo como co. I think I got it right that time. Is in what is now Gloucester County. It was a dreary journey that Captain Smith made to the capital of the great chief. It led through dense forests at a gloomy time of year, and he was heavily guarded by savages whose looks and actions indicated that they considered him doomed to death. Nevertheless, he appears never to have lost heart, sustained probably not only by his marvelous native courage, but by remembrance of his many escapes from serious danger. When they arrived at Werawokomoko, they were not admitted at once to the presence of the chief. Several days were spent in preparations, so that the ceremonies might be as impressive as possible, filling the Indians with a belief in the greatness and power of their tribe, and showing the men of Jamestown, if they should learn of it, what they might expect if they were not in every way friendly to the natives. When all was ready, the prisoner was brought into court. The place was an open space in the thick forest, with great trees making a high wall all around it. Powhatan, the emperor, who appeared to be about 60 years of age, sat in a longhouse on a throne that Captain Smith says looked like a bedstead. He was covered with a large robe made of raccoon skins with all the tails hanging out, and on the ground before him there was a fire, for now the weather was growing cold. On either hand, says Smith in his narrative, did sit a young woman of 16 or 18 years, and along on each side of the house two rows of men and behind them as many women, with all their heads and shoulders painted red. Many of their heads bedecked with the white down of birds, but every one with something, and a great chain of white beads around their necks. At his entrance before the king, all the people gave a great shout. The queen of Apamatuck was appointed to bring Smith water to wash his hands, and another brought him a bunch of feathers instead of a towel to dry them, they having feasted him after the best barbarous manner they could. A long consultation was held, Smith writes, but the conclusion was two great stones were brought before Powhatan. Then as many as could laid as many as could, I guess it says, then as many as could laid hands on Smith, dragged him to them, and thereupon laid his head, being ready with their clubs to beat out his brains. Pocahontas, the king's dearest daughter, when no entreaty could prevail, got Smith's head in her arms and laid her own upon his to save him from death whereat the emperor was contented he should live to make him hatchets and her bells, beads, and copper, for they thought him as well trained of all occupations as themselves. For the king himself will make his own robes, shoes, bows, arrows, pots, plant, hunt, or do anything so well as the rest. Two days afterward, Powhatan, having disguised himself in the most fearfulest manner he could, caused Captain Smith to be brought forth to a great house in the woods, and thereupon a mat by the fire to be left alone. Not long after, from behind a mat that divided the house, was made the most dolefulest noise he ever heard. They're speaking in Smith's language here, so he got some pretty strange words. Then Powhatan, more like a demon than a man, with some two hundred more as black as himself, came unto him and told him now they were friends, and presently he should go to Jamestown to send him two great guns and a grindstone, for which he would give him the country of Kapahawasik, and forever esteem him as his son, Nantoquand. So to Jamestown, with twelve guides, Powhatan sent him. That night they quartered in the woods, he still expecting, as he had done all this long time of his imprisonment, every hour to be put to one death or another, all for their feasting. But God had mollified the hearts of these stern barbarians with compassion, the next morning betimes they came to the fort, where Smith, having used the savages with what kindness he could, he showed Rahunt, Powhatan's trusty servant, two demi-culverins, these are small cannons, and a millstone to carry to Powhatan. They found them somewhat too heavy, but when they did see him discharge them, being loaded with stones among the boughs of a great tree loaded with icicles, and the ice and branches came so tumbling down that the poor savages ran away half dead with fear. But at last we regained some confidence with them and gave them such toys and sent to Powhatan his wife and children such presents as gave them in general full content. On his arrival at Jamestown this time, Captain Smith found the whole colony in a tangle, or, as he expresses it, all in combustion. Several were just getting ready to seize the pinnace, that's a small sailing boat, and sail away for England. 
but he trained a cannon on the boat and with his loaded musket at shoulder compelled them either to come ashore or be sunk. Others were plotting to have Smith executed on the ground that he was responsible for the death of the two men whom he had left in charge of his canoe and who were murdered by the Indians. But he says that he, quote, quickly took order with such lawyers that he laid them by the heels till he sent some of them prisoners for England, unquote. From this time, Pocahontas, accompanied by several women, came to Jamestown once in four or five days, bringing abundant supplies of provisions, without which the whole colony might have been starved. And Smith says that his relation of the plenty he had seen, especially at Wero Kokomoko, and of the state and bounty of Powhatan, so revived their dead spirits, especially the love of Pocahontas, as all men's fear was abandoned. Doubts have been raised as to the truth of the story of Pocahontas saving the life of Captain Smith, and there's been much discussion of the subject with attempts to analyze the evidence. The argument against it is founded mainly on the fact that the incident is not mentioned in the first of Smith's narratives, but is recorded in the latter one. It is to be considered that he sent his manuscript to England and was not there to read the proof or in any way supervise the printing, and so bunglingly was this done that one narrative, acknowledged to be his, bore the name of another man as the writer. It is not impossible that when the first account was presented for print, some meddling editor struck out whatever he thought was improbable or was put in merely to make the story popular. There is no question that Smith was a prisoner in the hands of the Indians, and surely some extraordinary influence must have prevented them from killing him. I prefer to believe the story of Pocahontas. We learn, however, that Captain Smith knew how to embellish a story and to invent incidents. In his account of his interview with Powhatan, he says, quote, He asked me the cause of our coming. I told him that, being in fight with the Spaniards, our enemy, and being overpowered, and near put to retreat by extreme weather, we put to this shore. When we landed at Chesapeake, the people shot at us, but Keokokaton, they kindly used us. When we, by signs, demanded fresh water, they described us, up the river all was fresh water. Our pinnace being leaky, we were forced to stay and mend her till Captain Newport, my father, came to conduct us away. He demanded why we went farther with our boat. I told him and that I would have occasion to talk of the back sea, that on the other side of the mainland, where there was salt water, my father had a child slain, which we supposed was done by Monica and his enemy, and his death we intended to revenge. After good deliberation, he began to describe me the countries beyond the falls, with many of the rest confirming what not only Opa Cancano, but an Indian prisoner, had before told me. But some called it five days' journey, some six, some eight, where the said water dashed amongst many stones and rocks, each storm which oft times caused the head of the river to be brackish. In Canachuk he described to be people that had slain my brother, whose death he would revenge. He described also upon the same sea a mighty nation called Pocatronac, a fierce nation that did eat men, and warred with the people of Moyancaser and Pateromeric, nations upon top of the head of the bay, under his territories, where the year before they had slain a hundred. He signified their crowns were shaven, long hair in the neck, tied on a knot, swords like pole-axes. Beyond them he described people with short coats and sleeves to the elbows that passed that way in ships like ours. Many kingdoms he described me to the head of the bay, which seemed to be a mighty river issuing from mighty mountains betwixt two seas. He described a country called Anon, where they have abundance of brass and houses walled like ours. I requited his discourse. In other words, I told as big lies as he did. Seeing what pride he had in his great and spacious domains, seeing that all he knew were under his territories. He says, in describing to him the territories of Europe, which were subject to our great king, whose subject I was, and the innumerable multitude of his ships, I gave him to understand the noise of trumpets and terrible manner of fighting were under Captain Newport, my father, whom I entitled the Merowents, which they call King of All the Waters. At his greatness, he admired and not a little feared. And that's the end of the quote of Captain Smith's Tall Tales. Probably neither of these men believed fully the boastful story told by the other, and yet Captain Smith still clung to the hope of discovering an outlet to the farther ocean by following up the course of one or another of the rivers that he found in Virginia. 
The Indians may not have been dishonest in assuring him that there was such an outlet, for they had various fanciful traditions relating to regions beyond their own domain, which they apparently never tested. Well, Captain Smith was a man who lived a life of adventure, did he not? But with that, we come to the end of our podcast for today. Thank you for joining me, my young friends. It's so good to be with my little buddies from time to time. I hope you enjoyed it as I enjoyed reading it to you. But I must now close, so I will say to you as I always do, little buddies, always put God first in your life. Be a patriotic American and honor thy father and thy mother. So long. Parents, if your kids enjoyed their visit with Uncle Rick, know that they will love the Uncle Rick Audiobook Club. The Uncle Rick Audiobook Club allows access to dozens more stories, both from history and the Bible, to help your kids learn about godly character. Here's what one parent had to say about the book club. My children love the stories. They make history so interesting. My son says it is because of the details that most textbooks don't include. Uncle Rick is easy to listen to. We love his accents and explanations. Thank you so much for that testimony. If you'd like to learn more about the Uncle Rick Book Club, please join us over at UncleRickAudios.com. That is UncleRickAudios.com. See you there.